Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is a delight to welcome you here this morning to St. George's, both those of you who are here in person and those who are joining us online. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Judges. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehu died. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jobin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagum. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Labadoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinam, from Gadesh in Napatali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take position at Mount Tabor. Bring 10,000 from the tribe of Napatali and from the tribe of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon and his chariots and his troops, and I will give you him into your hand. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, For it is as if a man goes on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with, accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not get scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what is my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Remaining standing, would you all pray with me? Lord, we are delighted to enter into your presence. We ask, Lord, that in your mercy, we might learn to cherish your gifts and to number our days, that we might indeed gain a heart of wisdom. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Now you can be seated. Thank you. haven't preached from this high in a while. <clears throat> the past few, few weeks, really uh, longer than that, we, we've been waiting, as you know, through the Gospel of Mark, and we've gone through all of these uh, different parables where we've heard from Jesus what the, the kingdom of God is like, and we get to one of these final ones before we enter into a more particular narratival movement in the Gospel. Jesus turns to uh, his true mission and task, which is the cross. But we've, we've, we've heard all, all kinds of stuff about the, the kingdom. Jesus says it's like a vineyard. He says it's like a, a wedding banquet or an estate. And even with all of these very tangible metaphors, I think that that phrase for us, the kingdom of God, can often be nearly incapacitated by abstractions. 
The kingdom of God can mean something like an ethical awareness to some, or developing an attitude of of goodwill, or maybe it can mean living with a greater sense of intentionality or just being a better people. But the kingdom of God that we've seen Jesus talk about is something very different. And that's in part what we saw in that Old Testament reading with all of the names that we couldn't pronounce. God chooses to use people with names and locations that are known. It's important. The kingdom of God is this dynamic movement established by God that doesn't hover over the world, some kind of platonic dream. It also is not reduced to the world, but it is like, exactly like the one who is established by Jesus the Son in the world, not of it, existing through time into the details of our lives, in the bodies of Christians gathered in buildings just like this one. And it will be made manifest, the kingdom, when the master comes again. Remember, this kingdom is given and this kingdom is coming and we're all involved in it. And the parables are clear here. It's vine dressers and tenants and slaves and bridesmaids. This kingdom is, of course, the church. It's us. It's me and you and all of your sisters and brothers who are baptized into the body of Christ. There is nothing abstract about the person sitting next to you in the pew, and likewise, there's nothing abstract about the kingdom of God. And in the same way that there's nothing abstract about this kingdom, there is also very little abstract about our vision or our mission, our vocation. And in our readings today, if we collect them together, I think we we see that we're given two things. We're given first gifts, and we're given second time. Gifts and time. Jesus' parable that we just heard Richard read describes how uh, all of these master's servants, they receive some portion of the master's resources. I'd like to call these gifts. The word used there is, is talents, which is a monetary unit, or really it's a weight of, of measure for a monetary unit. But I think that the, the, the main thrust here is that these, these are gifts. These talents are are our gifts, resources that are given to us. And then our psalm describes how we're all given time. We're given this expenditure of moments here on this earth in light of God's own purposes, and we're given an opportunity, verse says, the last beautiful line that they sung, to number our days. Again, nothing abstract about this. You all have come to receive gifts, human resources, that you didn't earn or you didn't buy, but that you nonetheless have. And I know many of you in here, some of you are great planners, some of you are caregivers, there are creatives in here, there are intellectuals and engineers and all sundry kinds of giftings. And all of these proclivities and resources, they're of course not of your own doing, are they? Have you ever thought, for instance, about that simple fact that no one chooses what IQ they have, what they look like, what genetic makeup they have, or even what family they're born into. And even, I think, parts of our own emotional dispositions aren't chosen by us. My mom is just a joyful lady. I have no clue how she's so joyful. She just is. She didn't choose it. She was built that way by her maker. And so our resources, they are a gift, and they're not ultimately ours. And then likewise, time. We're given time, this number of days in the world, our own lives. And this is also something that we didn't choose. I know this is obvious, but bear with me. Time, I think, is a kind of unmerited grace. And to steward this time is, I think, a deep and distinct calling within the kingdom of God. For instance, Christians generations ago would pray that they didn't die unexpectedly. If you've ever been here on a holy day, you'll remember that we read this thing called the Great Litany. It's a famous prayer that Thomas Cranmer Cranmer wrote uh, centuries ago. And in it, there is a prayer that we all would not die unexpectedly. Why do they pray that? Because they want to use God's time wisely. We pray that because we want to live our lives faithfully to the end. We want to number our days. 
And so I think the question for us that both the psalm and the parable pose together is how are we going to use these gifts, these resources, and this time for the kingdom of God? How will you use the gifts you've been given? How will St. George's use our resources for the kingdom? And I think first we have to be absolutely honest and look at the parable for what it is. The parable describes a master who goes away and gives his financial resources to servants with the hope that, of course, they'll they'll make more. But that money, of course, it isn't theirs. And likewise, the gifts that we are given, because they are God's, they have to be used in light of his own desires. And so I have to ask you, what would it actually be like to use your gifts or your resources as if they're God's? As I try to imagine this, I think, you know, you, you you wouldn't brag about or be prideful of these gifts because they're not yours. But also you wouldn't ignore them or be falsely humble about them because they are given to you. They're given to you in a gracious sense of charity. But again, they're not yours and you didn't determine them. I for one, however, am often tempted either to one, claim that what's been given to me is my own achievement, look at what I did, or second, to compare what I've been given to other people which of course just makes you grow envious, wish you had other people's talents or gifts, resources. But if you could, if we could use these resources in light of their being God's own, wouldn't it feel amazing, I think? I think it would feel like freedom because you'd be able to enjoy the gifts that God has given others. You would also be free to never have to defend your own because it's given by God. And the point is, the master gives what he chooses. The parable says it clear enough. Some get one talent, some get five. All are given a gift and all are made, of course, in the master's images. And so we all have resources, but as soon as we take them as our own, none of it actually matters. I once heard a mentor preach that Christians, they're not actually special people. They just know what their lives are for. I think that's absolutely right. We know what our lives, we know what our gifts, we know what our resources are for. They're God's and we shepherd them with seriousness, urgency, freedom, and for the sake of others. Now before moving on, I think there's another side to this that's worth exploring. Even though our our lives, our, our gifts and resources deserve our full stewardly attention, maybe even greater attention because they're not our own, God has made us finite. Finitude, no matter how much we hate it, and often we do, it is not a sin. Again, Psalm 90 says this clear enough, God is everlasting, but man returns to dust. The point here is we are finite. We're made with limitations. And that's actually at the heart of what it means to be God's own. I often personally find it strange that our culture has well, it struggles to, to, to come up with some working definition of, of sin. And yet it's strange that we all feel this deep guilt about anything that looks like limitation or rest, don't we? I do. There's this constant pressure to always be available or to always be working or to never be delayed or never let your body, your illness, or whatever it is get in the way. And we feel, some of us, feel shame about that. But in God's infinite wisdom, infinite wisdom, he's made us finite. Infinitude is no sin. Our faithful use of God's gifts does not require us to transcend our own finitude. And I personally think that people desperately need to hear that from the church. Humans are certainly sinners. God certainly forgives sins. But our own finitude, it is not a sin. It's how God made you. God made you that way. And he intends for you to use his resources precisely in light of how he's made you as a finite human being. So there should be times that you exhaust yourself for the kingdom of God, that we work with urgency and and desire and ferocious energy. And there should also be times where we simply go to sleep, where we rest. We recognize that we are not God. 
Teach us, O Lord, to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Finally, we're called, I think, to use the resources we've been given in light of God's own character. I don't know if you noticed, but, the, but the, there are three servants, right, in the parable. The final one is given one talent, and he's rebuked. Do you, do you remember why he's rebuked? It's because he buries his talent. He buries the money. He doesn't use it, and he wastes that opportunity. And the reason that he buries it again, if you read carefully, is because it says he was afraid. He replies to the master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you do not sow, and gathering where you do not scatter seed, and so I was afraid. And the servant, from what I can tell, is perhaps right about one aspect of the kingdom of God. God the Father does, in a way, gather where he doesn't sow. He has sent us out into the world to reap what we've not planted, but that is generated out of God's own kingdom moving in and through the world. But what this servant gets dead wrong is his fear. The fear is where he gets wrong. Fear of the master and perhaps fearfulness about using the gifts that he's been entrusted with. And I think that's one of the reasons the Bible is so clear about the imperative to not be afraid. You know how many times the Bible says to not be afraid in some form or another? It's a remarkable number. It's 365. I didn't make that up, that's true. It's 365, one for each day of the year. Don't be afraid. And the one major calling that we have to steward the resources that God has given us To use those resources, the one mistake we make is to fear. Fear about what could happen if we use these resources and also fear of the giver. But if you know the giver, and I do, some of you do, we know that he's given us himself, all of himself. Not an abstraction, but his own son, a person. And he's given us his blood. And so the resources that you and I hold on to, they are a great, wonderful gift, but they are only whatever they are because of the life of the giver, God the Father. And I realize we have all kinds of things going on at St. George's right now. There are transitions, there's a pandemic, I mean, you name it, there are all kinds of things this day going on at St. George's, and I know that that's true in your own lives as well. And in my experience, the great temptation in moments like this is to cling, to bury, to hide, to be afraid. But we have no reason to be afraid because again, we have one who has given us himself, who has even given us a deposit in the spirit. And he has promised that he will be with us to the end of the age. So to each of you, I challenge you, come in the church going home, if you are tempted to be afraid, to hoard whatever resources you have or to hide those, remember the one who has given himself. So beginning this week, let us use the resources, the time that God has given us for his purposes. Let us remember our own finitude and let us give exhaustively, freely in light of the giver who loves us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us remember together why it is that we do not need to be afraid and proclaim the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, 
Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. In the Anglican Communion, we pray for the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin. In the Church of Ceylon, in the Episcopal Church, we pray for our presiding Bishop Michael. In the Diocese of Tennessee, we pray for our Bishop John. Odie Memorial Parish in Swanee, All Saints Chapel in Swanee, in the Chapel of the Apostles in St. Andrew's Swanee School. In the community, we pray for Vine Street Christian Church and Jones Padilla Elementary School. In our parish, we pray for Play On at St. George's Concert Series. And our Nashville fellows, Brianna, Clay, DeLacy, and Garner, Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. We pray for our President Donald, our President-elect Joe, our Governor Bill, our Mayor John. We pray for the members of our parish serving our country in the armed forces. We pray for our enemies and those who wish us harm. Give grace, give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer for many grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Sue Atkinson, Reba Parker, Betty Graham, Marge Maxwell, Al Susan Naramore, Kelly Price, Acra Samuel, Mary Reedy Taylor. We also pray for Carolyn Osborne, our new priest who has gone into early labor. And we pray for the victims of Hurricane Iota, especially our friends at Our Little Roses in Honduras. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. Especially Lincoln Witt Bivens, Alex McLeod, and Albert Warren Nicely. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and for those of others. You are invited to add your own intercessions and thanksgivings, either silently or aloud. We pray for Madeline Jones. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, 
where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Now as you are able, let us kneel and confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, ordinarily, of course, uh, we would soon be passing an offering plate, which would be a tangible reminder of our responsibility to one another, to the church, and to God. We are now in our stewardship season, and we'll actually have our celebration Sunday a bit early this year on December 6th. And here to talk to us about stewardship this morning is Paige Mench. Thank you, Paige. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. As Marjorie said, my name is Paige Mench, and my husband Henry and I have been members of St. George's since 2007. Um, since that time, we've had three children. We have William, who's 10, Ann Harris, who's 9, and Walker, who is 6. And I'm actually speaking to, this mor to you this morning both as a fellow parishioner but also as a member of the vestry. And I would like to share with you a little bit about my experience with that. Um, I think I have to admit that when I was called three years ago and asked to join the vestry, I hesitated for several days. Um, and when I started to really think about it, what I <laughs> learned was, you know, sometimes you go behind the curtain and you see how the sausage is made and you're not really excited about it. I think I was afraid that would happen, but I have to tell you, my last three years in the vestry have been exactly the opposite. And one thing I want to share with you about that experience is that I have learned this church is full of clergy, full of staff, full of lay leaders who care very deeply about each and every one of you. And they want to meet you exactly where you are in your walk with Christ to help you take that next step that's right for you. And that goes for the people who are here every single Sunday, for the people who are out there and lost, and everyone in between. And in fact, my challenge to you today is that if you don't see that and you don't feel that, please reach out. Um, we even have a member of the staff, Martha Rhodes, didn't tell her I was going to say this, but I know she'd be fine with it, um, who accepted the job of director of lay ministries because she wants to get to know you and she wants to help you find that very right place for you at St. George's. And I guess before I joined the vestry, I kind of knew this was happening, but I am deeply grateful for the chance to see it up close over these past three years, and I am so excited about the future of this church. Uh, which brings me to the stewardship campaign. And I want to talk to you about why we give and why I hope you will give. And for me, it really boils down to what I call the four C's. Uh, the first is that your pledge is a commitment to the church. This is a large building, it's about to get bigger. It requires electricity, it requires plumbing, maintenance, upkeep. It facilitates our programming, our Christian education, our fellowship, our community education. And frankly, all of that takes money. We employ a large staff to make that happen, and they actually depend on your generosity because all of that funding comes out of your stewardship dollars. The second is a commitment to the congregation. 
As Christians, we are a community of believers, and it takes engagement from every single member of that community to help it to thrive. And so your pledge is your commitment to the congregation that you care about them, and the same way their pledge is their commitment to you, that we're going through this together. The third is the commitment to the broader community. There are so many people who depend on St. George's, whether it's through our monetary contributions or through the use of our facilities for groups like AA and Boy Scouts. And we hope that only continues to grow as we open the new Parish Life Center in 2021. And finally, and most importantly, is your commitment to Christ. Giving is biblical. It is stressed throughout the Old and the New Testament. And your pledge to the stewardship campaign shows that as a follower of Christ, you understand that directive and responsibility that we have. So I hope you will consider these four elements that I've laid out as you think about your contribution to the stewardship campaign. I am delighted to report that 100% of the vestry members have made their pledge, and we hope that you'll do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. I remember before I was ordained, uh, my parish in New England, New England, of course, noted for frugality, perhaps more than generosity. Um, uh, the, uh, the rector, uh, he said, well, and I especially pray God's blessing on all the tithers. And I was like, is that moral? Can you do that? But uh, it pricked up my ears. It's like, okay, I hear that invitation. It is, if you have not realized it, Name tag, November. I don't know if you have seen uh, the little video that your clergy have lovingly prepared for you, but our very own Reverend Q makes his debut as Q from MI6 in James Bond. So I highly commend that to you, and of course, the wearing of name tags, which really makes this masked world uh, complicated to navigate. Finally, um, many of you, actually an astounding number of you, have been participating in these MARC groups. Um, and we've heard just wonderful feedback from the leaders who have been leading these groups with you. Um, one of the things is just the sort of unity that he's created amongst the congregation. Well, we're literally all on the same page. Um, learning through the Gospel of Mark, of course, fellowship opportunities, and just um, scripture never gets old. I'm always amazed when I open the Bible. It says that, I think to myself. So um, I invite you, if you haven't been able to join the Mark group, to consider joining our Genesis group, which will be starting uh, after Christmas. So just to put that uh, on your back burner. Ascribe to the Lord the honor, do his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts.
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days, you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world, in him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>